Today on The Roundhouse, we are talking about one of the greatest photographers in railroading, O. Winston Link. All aboard! In days past, the Roundhouse was where the railroad worker united with the steam locomotive, each to prepare for the journey ahead. Today, it's where we examine the history, the industry, the machines, the hobby, and the passion behind railroading. News, interviews, stories, and more. So climb aboard. This is The Roundhouse. Welcome to The Roundhouse. I'm your host, Nick Ozerak, and this is episode number 92 of our Trains and Railroading podcast, where we're talking about everything in the industry and the hobby. You name it, and we discuss it today. We are talking about O. Winston Link, his legacy, his work, and his museum. We are specifically talking with Lindsay Alley, who is the museum manager for the O. Winston Link Museum in Roanoke, Virginia, about how he approached his famous Norfolk and Western Railway steam project and what you can experience when you go to visit the museum. Before I get to that, though, I just want to thank you guys for tuning in on the roundhouse and listening as you can see we're being a little bit more regular with our episodes right now so we intend to do that for the foreseeable future but i appreciate you guys for sticking with us for the parts of time where there were slightly longer gaps having your support is always appreciated and to show it we are coming up on episode number 100 which is kind of crazy to me to i remember recording the first episode, and number 100 is not that far away. So, what we're going to do for episode 100 is a panel. We're going to bring back some of our previous guests that we've had on the show to vote on which guests you'd like to see return. There's going to be a link in the show notes. I've also posted it on Facebook and Twitter, so you can get the link there. But you can just go to the show notes for episode number 92 and vote on which guests you'd like to see return for episode 100. Our guest today is the museum manager for the O. Winston Link Museum in Roanoke, Virginia. Please welcome to the Roundhouse, Ms. Lindsay Alley. Hi, Nick. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you on the show to talk about a man who in the world of rail fanning needs very little introduction, Mr. O. Winston Link, known for his very evocative photographs of the last days of steam on the Norfolk and Western Railway. How did he get started in photography? He grew up um, in New York. That is where he, he lived um, his whole life. And his dad, um, Albert Link, from like a very early age was, you know, he wanted to like give all of his kids um, like a really like well-rounded sort of background. And so he was always trying to instill in them like woodworking and photography and different sort of like creative type of things. So he was exposed to stuff like that pretty early on. Um, And then when he was in high school, he had a job at a local drugstore where he like developed the photos and stuff that people would um, bring in. And, Then, you know, he went on and he got a degree in civil engineering in college. Um, But then it was like right as the depression was hitting and, you know, they weren't really hiring a lot of civil engineers. And at his graduation, he gave a speech and there was someone there at the graduation um, party that worked for like an advertising agency. And they just, for some reason, just really like, thought he was like witty and funny and just all these things. And he had that background doing like different photography type things. Um, And so they hired him for this ad agency to take like, you know, photographs for different ads um, for their clients. And then he worked there for a little bit. Um, And then when World War II started, he worked at the Airborne Instruments Laboratory which was doing some work with like underwater photography sort of things to try and like 
I don't know how to describe it like correctly, <laughs> uh, but they were trying to get um, like images of submarines, like so planes could fly over the water and they could sort of see where submarines were. Um, and so he just sort of was in photography from like the very beginning. It's funny that he was able to use these skills in such different ways. When I was researching him and learned about his role during World War II, it was interesting that his defense work took him to photographing some of the military jets of the time as well. He did a lot. I mean, he was constantly just doing all sorts of different projects. Um, yeah, and the, the military, the plane, um, and where he was working um, in New York during the war, apparently the Long Island Railroad went like very close to where he was working and he was trying to like test out this idea of like photographing trains. And so he apparently was taking some photos of the Long Island Railroad, which was very much like <laughs> a big no-no during wartime. Like you don't, don't do that. Um, and so he was sort of like clandestine trying to take these photos um, and test out all these techniques and stuff. So yeah, this was a, a long time coming, uh, this, the NNW project. Knowing that he was involved in advertising photography gives a different angle to when you look at his work as well. It makes you recognize that these weren't just photos taken on the fly, but that they were designed to convey a specific message, that there was a deliberate intent behind them in the same way that advertising photography is trying to highlight the product to make it have the greatest appeal. Yeah, he was not a huge, like, candid shot person. Like, he definitely had an idea of, like, what he wanted to capture. So he was very uh, specific in that regard. Jonas Schneider asks, what made him want to photograph the Norfolk and Western Railway specifically? Specifically, he, like I said, he was doing commercial, like, photography work um, out of New York, and he was here in Stanton, Virginia, which is about two hours north-ish of Roanoke, where the museum is. Um, he was in Stanton on assignment at a Westinghouse air conditioner factory to sort of take photos for them, and a Norfolk and Western, like, steam engine just happened to like pass by this factory and it just like reignited this idea that he had of trying to photograph a train um like a steam engine and norfolk and western was actually the last holdout um you know that was still using steam everyone else all the other major railroad railroads had already um you know converted to diesel and so Norfolk and Western was it. And I guess he, he sort of saw the writing on the wall there and knew that it was only a matter of time, um, you know, before the, the Norfolk and Western lines also were, were diesel. So when he saw that, it just, you know, sort of clicked with him. Um, and he went like later that day, I believe, there's a depot in Waynesboro, uh, which was not far from Stanton. And he took his very first photo that night um, in Waynesboro of a train. Why did he choose to take so many of his photographs at night? He did like to have control over an image. And when he was running all of these lights and flash bulbs, he did it in such a way that he knew what he was going to illuminate um, on any given image. So he liked having that control um, and trying to draw your eye into like certain features, certain things um, in a photo. So he very much um, was all about that. And, you know, he, he said something like, you know, moving the, the sun and you can't move the tracks. And so you have to do something else to better light the engine. So um, he just really was very keen on using the technical aspect. Um, I guess that's the civil engineering background coming coming into play um to get to get these photos that he had wanted jason moyer comments 
I'm just trying to imagine how many lights and how many hours it took to set up for a specific shot puts all of us toting digital cameras to shame. Yeah, so that is for sure. Anytime I give a tour, especially if there's younger people on the tour, I try really hard to like make them realize how difficult it was for him to get these photos. I mean, it's not like and everyone has like a smartphone and can just snap a picture and put like a black and white filter on it and adjust with like a slide, you know, all these different like effects on the phone. Um, you know, he had to go out and he had to scout locations along the, the route, you know, where he would be able to set up. Um, and he had notebooks like filled filled with like all these notes about like landscape and time of day and different um, things to consider. And he had all of this equipment, his lighting equipment, his cameras, his, you know, tripod things to set up, um, you know, and the, he set up so many flash bulbs. And I mean, you have to put in each bulb and each like flash. I mean, it was a huge undertaking. Um, and there's some photos you can look on our um, website, like in our digital collections, there's photos of him. He's got like wires, like tight ropes, basically run across a river. And he like apparently spent days, like two or three days going like shuffling, like tight rope style across this river, trying to set up for this photo um, that he wanted to, to get. And, you know, all the flash equipment, I think, depending on how many flashes he had to set off, it was up to a mile of wire he had to run to connect all the flash equipment um, with his camera so that they would all go off simultaneously. I mean, it was a massive, massive undertaking. Um, there's also a photo that we have of him at the Cloverdale station. And Again, he he knew what he wanted and he, you know, in his image and what he wanted to capture. And there's a photo of him building this like platform on the roof of this station because he wanted, like I said, to get get this image. So, I mean, it was just a huge undertaking. And I, I mean, it was quite labor intensive for sure. The preparation that he had with the human actors as well was extensive where he would be location scouting but he also knew what he wanted as far as people subjects when he would have people or autos in the foreground and then the train going through the background sometimes being outside of a gas station or he'd be in somebody's house and that was all before emailing. So the letter writing, I gather, was very extensive there, too. He actually made a lot of friends um, during this project from 55 to 1960 is when he did um, the Norfolk and Western Project. And, I mean, he just made so many trips from New York, like to, you know, Virginia and North Carolina and, and the along the route of Norfolk and Western. And he was like a typical New Yorker, I'm told. And he just would like strike up conversations with people and, you know, just strangers he would meet along the the line here trying to take these photos would invite him to dinner, you know, and they would have him like stay at their house while he was in town. And I mean, he, he just made friends and um, yeah, just really, really hit it off with several folks. Uh, and families along the line. So it helped for sure. But um, yeah, he he did like some stage a lot of photos. I know you mentioned like the gas station. Um, and there's a photo, it's titled When the Electricity Fails. And it's got like the gravity gas pump. And there's like this young couple sitting in a car and the huge steam engine is like just roaring by like a foot away from them. Um, and we have a very large scale image of that that photo um, at the museum. And I always like to point out on like any tours that I'm giving, you know, this photo was taken in Virginia. But if you look at the tags on the car that's in the photo, those are New York tags. 
because that's his car. That's Mr. Link's personal vehicle. And he, you know, just found these, these two people and he wanted, again, he, he knew what he wanted. So he got them to sit in his car so he could take this photo and, and get what he, he had envisioned. Something that makes this project so endearing as well is knowing that everything he was doing was self-funded. He was doing this solely out of the passion of his desire to see it come to reality. And six years of this, that is serious dedication, especially considering that he was living in New York. Yeah, and I think that's like a common, like, misconception, I suppose, that people think he was like a photographer for the railway um, and that he was somehow like hired by them or was paid by them. And he was not. Yes, this project was entirely self-funded. Um, they gave him, he talked to like a lot of the, um, the CEOs at the railroad um, and they gave him permission to like be on Norfolk and Western property um, to take these photos. I mean, he explained what he was doing and, and they seemed to support it and be behind it, but they, yeah, they weren't going to pay him. Um, and he did also have the ability to like stop trains and start trains to like get these photos. So he did have that ability as well. Um, but yeah, I think he very much originally underestimated <laughs> how many times he was going to be down in Virginia and like North Carolina and West Virginia to get these photos. Um, you know, he, I think originally was like, Oh, like a, a few trips from New York to here and I'll get what I want. And I mean, yes, it went on for several years. So I think, I think the, the few trips turned into many, many more. Of his work, my personal favorite focus is his work on the Abingdon branch, especially because so much of that was daytime photography, which was a bit more unusual in the context of his project. Yeah, so the Abingdon branch, was, I've been told, is Mr. Link's favorite. That was his favorite, which I always find sort of ironic because he's so well known for the nighttime photography and like that was his, his thing and it was so innovative. Um, but yet his favorite part of the NNW route was the Abingdon branch where they could only run the trains during the day. <laughs> so all of the daytime color photos are almost all exclusively from that part of the Norfolk and Western route. Um, the grades there were too steep to run and they were too dangerous to run the trains at night. And so that's why all of the photos are, are mainly daytime there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, of the thousands, several thousand photos he did as part of this project, there's only a, I think three or four hundred um, that come that are in color in daytime and that come from the Abingdon branch. So it's a really a really nice collection for that part of the route. The people really stand out in that body of work too. There's great images of the train itself, which was called the Virginia Creeper, the most famous of which is the photo Old Maud bows to the Virginia Creeper, which I'm sure you've seen it before if you're listening, the one with the horse bowing as the train approaches on the left side of the Green Cove train station. So something like that's nice. But all these photos of the crew, or there's one with a station master and she's knitting that I think gives such character to this little branch line, which would have been easy to overlook when you looked at the big steam that was on the main line. Yeah. And that is a really nice piece of his work. I think that, you know, I don't know if that was originally his intention to capture, like, you know, the people and the lives that sort of sprung up um, as a result of the railroad. But it is really nice to sort of see and have that record of, of history, um, you know, because it was, you know, the 50s and it was sort of the golden age of travel. And so you got to see all of these things happening um, in his photos. And I mean, it's just such interesting stories. Uh, you were talking about the lady knitting. I think that might be Gladys. Um, 
and she was like one of only a two or three, I think, female like station masters. And there's a story associated with her that she held a train. She wouldn't let it leave the station during a, it was like a bad snowstorm. And there was a lady that was in labor and she was having a lot of complications and they had to get her to the hospital, but they couldn't get like a car through or an ambulance couldn't get to her or something because of the snowstorm. And so Gladys like held a train for like two hours, I think, until they could get that woman on the train and like get her to town. So, I mean, just, you know, you see the photo and you're like, oh, that's, that's a nice photo. I really, you know, like that photo, but just, you know, sometimes the stories that are behind it are even, even better. (laughs) With this impressive body of work, why then did it take until the 80s for it to gain popularity? You know, I I don't know exactly. I don't have a definite answer <laughs> for that. I mean, I think it might just be, you know, possibly like things today. Like, you know, I see, you know, certain cars out all the time. So if I see a photo of one, you know, you might not initially like have a strong reaction to it. It's just like, oh, that's just another photo of another train, you know. Um, But I think, you know, it seemed sort of faded away and it was all replaced by like planes and cars and, you know, like the diesel trains. Um, I think it it sort of brought back like memories of, of the, like I said, the golden age of travel and sort of the romanticized um air of steam and you know I just I know that his audio he did take when he was out shooting all of these uh photos a lot of times he would do audio recordings of the trains going by as well and I know that those even like in the 60s like really early on he was well known for his audio and like video much more than his photos I mean he was selling his photos for like Twenty twenty five dollars a piece, like very early on, because nobody wanted to buy them. Um, but yeah, and then just like eighties and nineties, it just sort of exploded, and here we are. <laughs> you did a tour, a virtual tour recently, Lindsay, where you were showcasing some of those audio recordings. I thought it was so funny that part of the marketing was about disturbing your neighbors and <laughs> is that not the best <laughs> chasing people away right. for a rail fan it'd be a matter of saying here's this beautiful recording of steam at work but for the general public it's yeah i use this as general noise right like ways to what is it like annoy my landlord and make my mother-in-law angry and i mean it's just it's so funny like i didn't notice it for the longest time and then one day i just happened to actually stop and read that and i was like oh my gosh that's pretty hilarious um actually so i think i was uh smart marketing on his part (laughs) in my opinion i just thought that was really funny um but i will say there is an audio recording um, on his second uh, volume of of audio, and it's the Christmas. It's like got Christmas um, like church bells going in the background as like a train goes by, and it is one of our most popular. People request it, look for a CD, want the vinyl, all the time, constantly. It's one of our best selling items. People just have to have it, and it's it is actually really nice. In this day and age of vinyl resurgence, are you able to have copies of his audio recordings made for vinyl? We don't. um, That's not something that we have. We have CDs, like sets. They've been transferred to CD, um, you know, recently. But it's really hard to get a hold of the vinyl, actually. Um, And we, like I said, that's just not a project we've embarked upon right now to, like, reproduce or recreate or whatever um, copies of the actual vinyl. We did come across a set, I believe, and they went almost immediately. Um, We weren't able to keep them in the store very long. So, yeah, they're definitely very popular. 
Let's take a step back. What led to the formation of the Owenston Lake Museum? Since Norfolk and Western, they were headquartered in Roanoke. Um, and so he constantly was in Roanoke. You know, the, he made visits here a lot. I mean, he had a lot, a lot of friends here in Roanoke um, and just sort of was here pretty frequently. And so that's the, sort of the idea behind it. Um, the museum itself is actually in an old Norfolk and Western passenger station, um, very appropriately. So that's where we are. And there were um, like a handful of people that were like really good friends with Link and really, I think they were also connected to Norfolk and Western um, initially. But um, yeah, they, they thought that it would be like a good um, showcase for his work and for work that really highlighted sort of this area um, in like an important like era in history. And so they worked for many, many years trying to like get everything set up and get the space ready and just get everything sort of put together. Um, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Link, he passed away in 2001 and the museum opened in early 2004. So he actually didn't get to see the museum open, which um, is very sad because I'm sure he would be very pleased um, with the with the space. But um, yeah, it was definitely a big, big undertaking and, and it took some time, but it's here now and it's wonderful. And we have visitors from all over uh, the U.S. and all like abroad. Um, we have people from all over that come to see the museum. Describe how you use the space to convey the story and his history. We have many galleries. And so, you know, if you watch the virtual tour, the Pocahontas Gallery is dedicated to sort of the people um, of Norfolk and Western. And so you'll see that in that space, there's a lot of the workers on the NNW and the um, CEOs at NNW and different people along the railroad. And then, you know, Shenandoah Gallery is, is a bigger space and it has like more information about his um, early like commercial work. And we have some examples of that there. And then it sort of also has his like lighting equipment. And so you can actually see like stuff he actually used and read about like how you had to change every bulb every time, you know, one time photo, like one time use for each photo. Um, we also have his dark room there. So that it came from his house in New York. They went and got it and brought it here and, and set it back up in the museum um, to sort of, you know, again, just illustrate the process of like setting up for a photo, taking it and you had to develop it. And then that is also where a lot of his probably well-known, more well-known photos are housed in the Shenandoah Gallery. Um, and so you can sort of see a lot, and it's a lot of black and white photos are there as well. Um, and then the Radford Gallery at the museum, that is, it's right now at the rotating gallery. Um, but when it's not a different exhibit that's come in, we have Abingdon Branch. Um, there to sort of show the daytime color, you know, photography. Um, so we try and highlight like all, like his early work, his famous, like more well-known, black and white, iconic sort of shots, then the people of the railroad, and then, you know, like the Abingdon branch with the different, like the color photography. So we try and hit all the, the major <laughs> high points in the museum. Brian Smith asks, what's the most surprising thing that you've found in the collection that the public hasn't seen on exhibit yet? Well, I know one thing that I found like interesting, and I, I guess this is legal and would work, um, but we had a donor actually bring in a stack of like maybe five or 10 letters that he had just found. Apparently there was like a, a garbage bag or a trash can or something that like, I don't know, it like blown over and like garbage was everywhere and he's helping clean it up. And in it, he found all these letters from 
Mr. Link from him that he had written to himself when he was out, like if he was, you know, here taking photos along the the line and he had an idea for something, he would like write himself a letter and send it to his house in New York. And so that if he ever had to like get a copyright or a patent or anything, he had like a date, like a time date stamp to sort of prove when he came up with an idea. So if anyone tried to like duplicate or copy or anything, he sort of had like this record. And I mean, it's interesting just how they were found. I mean, they were in the trash somehow and someone just saw them and realized what they were um, and then brought them to us. And then just, again, the, the sort of thought that went in to with Mr. Link to just think of, think of like, well, this is a great idea. I'm going to write this down and send it to myself. So that way I have a record, you know, for later on, should something happen. I mean, it was just, I would never have (laughs) really thought of that. So I think that's pretty interesting. Does the museum own the copyright to his photos or just some of them, how does that work exactly? If somebody wants to, say, have a print made of Hot Shot Eastbound, his famous photo with the movie theater, what does one do for that? Well, I will tell you, you cannot reprint uh, the Link Estate and Trust uh, that was set up before he died. Um, you can't reprint um, photos for like private use or anything like that. Um, we do have a poster reproduction of that and it's, uh, you know, it's a different sort of, you know, it has like a border and different things around it um, that sort of make it different from the original. But um, Conway Link, who is the son of Mr. Link, uh, he actually is the copyright owner. And so we work with him. I have to um, work with him if like, a magazine or a book or, you know, any sort of publication wants to use a photo, I go through him and get that okayed and, and go from there. Um, But we, we do own the the negatives and the photos. They're at the museum with us, but um, yeah, like I said, I work with him to, to okay any sort of reproduction. It's good that his family is still involved in the process of this and that you have that collaboration to work off of. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Of his work, Lindsay, what pieces are your favorites? There's just, I mean, there's so many. Like I said, he has thousands, thousands of photos that he took. Um, but I think one, one of my favorites is, I call it Popes on the Porch. Um, That's not its official title, (laughs) but it's the couple. It's Mr. and Mrs. Ben Pope, I think is his first name, Ben. Um, And they're standing like with their arm around each other, like on the porch of their house. And they're watching one of the last steam engines. They know it's like one of the last ones going on that route by their house. And they like are just standing at night out on their porch, like front porch, just watching it sort of go by. And I just think that's a really sweet um, sort of moving image. Um, so that's probably one of one of my favorites. There's also a series um, called Hester Fringer's Living Room. And I think it's like five or six images. And it's my favorite, one of my favorites for a different reason. Um, if you look, look up this series, you can see it's like this lady and her son Uh, he's like playing in the living room and there's like cats and a dog and there's just sort of a lot going on. And then this like massive steam uh, engine is like rolling. It looks like it's three feet outside their window. I mean, it is, (laughs) it is quite the image, but the lady in the photo that's sitting there, she just looks so annoyed. It, (laughs) It just kind of makes me laugh a little bit to see it. And it's, again, it's one of his more well-known photos, but man, she just looks absolutely uninterested, unenthused about this photo. I mean, I don't know if it's the photo or the the cats and dog or the kid. (laughs) I don't know what's happening, but it just, it sort of um, 
strike me as a humorous image. So I like that one as well. It has a quality of the Mona Lisa in the sense of there's so many questions about is she smiling? Is she not smiling? What's the intention? And a lot of great artists, when you're looking at their work, especially when they do have human subjects, you're thinking about what is the intent of the subject because there can be this air of mystery. So that's an interesting one to select for that reason because you don't know exactly what she's thinking, but there's clearly something that she is thinking about. I know. And like I said, it's a series. So there's like slight variations, like some she's like sitting up more and sort of it looks like maybe she's talking to her son, um, you know, but it's just like I said, it sort of is, is humorous. And I feel like it is an appropriate photo for today. Like, you know, what's going on now? I mean, has she been in isolation for, <laughs> you know, however many weeks and is just like ready for a cocktail? I don't know. Um, but yeah, it just, like I said, it sort of strikes me as a, a funny image and I, I like it. Sam Ulrich asks, what's the future of the wonderful museum in particular, the Abington collection, as much of that gallery room has been removed recently? You know, I think we're just proceeding as, as normal. We have tours. Well, we had to cancel some tours, um, that normally would be coming through spring and summers, like our busiest time. So things, you know, they've sort of shifted in the last month or so. Um, but yeah, we just hope to keep wel welcoming um, visitors from all over the world. And um, we did do, and I'm, I'm sure we, we plan to do this in the future, um, different exhibits about Mr. Link. Like one exhibit we had was like Link into Landscape. And it was a lot of his like work from Canada and um California and out west some um, and just different things that maybe people aren't as familiar with from him um and so you know I think it would be good to sort of rotate through different images so people can see and like draw people back um to see different things that he did because he did do so much um but yeah so I think you know we're just trying to have people come in and, and visit and you know the Abingdon branch like I said it'll go back up um, at some point we do have this like holiday um, event that happens in that space so you know we have the the Jimmy Deck Light and Shadow you had mentioned the the 360 virtual tour that's in there right now um, so when that comes down um, probably Santa will go in there for for the holidays um, and then we'll go from there. But yeah, Abingdon Branch does make make frequent appearances um, back in that space in between uh, rotating exhibits. So yeah, we're just trying to do the best that we can. There's a lot of photographers in this day and age who, in the railroad world, try to emulate his work, or at the very least, get a foothold on doing night photography. Have you ever done seminars about railroad photography, the technical aspects or things that are how-tos that photographers could apply to their own work or having other photographers talk about how they've been inspired by Link to do their own work? We have done some photography like classes. They haven't been so much geared um, toward Link, like specifically. I have had the idea, and I just I need to put this all together. But I've had an idea to do like a a day trip sort of class because um, there's a book that is really good. It's following the owl's footsteps. O W L. Uh, for O. Winston Link, and this person has gone to, like, all these sites, and he, like, has, like, the coordinates down, like, specifically, like, where Link stood to get all these different photos, and so I think it would be a really cool idea to use that book and do, like, a, like I said, like, a day sort of long class um, where people can maybe, like, go and follow, like, O. Winston Link along, like, you know, his his trek through this area to get these photos and try and like maybe recreate some photos. Um, 
we have done, it, we call it then and now photography class, and um, we're located like right in downtown um, Roanoke, and so we have a lot of photos in our collection um, of like historic downtown Roanoke, and so that's one thing that we've done that's actually been popular is that people get a photo of downtown Roanoke in like 1905 and they have to go to like the exact street and try and recreate the image and then compare like you know the the then and the now um and like so that's been really popular we have had um an actual class from a local community college come in and they come in regularly um each semester to look at link and and one time they did a specific nighttime photography class and so they actually came in in the evening for a tour and then I think they went out and like um, took some of their own photos at night and like I said being an old um, passenger station we are actually right up against some tracks of Norfolk and Western we obviously don't have steam engines going by but we do have a fair amount of like the diesel going by so um, I think they got some good good images that night but yeah, we have some ideas in the works. My last question for you, Lindsay, is what do you think is the most important aspect of preserving Link's work? I mean, I think it's just, like I said, he captured such a like point in history where steam was sort of fading out and it was easier for people to travel. And so people were like leaving small rural communities and like going elsewhere and you know diesel trains they they don't take as much maintenance they don't take as much work to run so people were like having to find other jobs and other means of of work and i mean i think it was just such a a transitional period that he captured um you know seeing these people in these like rural like just towns that had sprung up along the railway, um, you know, that, that made their living that way. And then it just sort of ended and faded. And, you know, as part of that, I think it's also important to, again, realize the work that went in to this project. I mean, like I say, I try and impress upon people that it's not, none of this was digital. I mean, it was like such a labor intensive thing setting all this up and, and scouting all this out, um, you know, to prepare for these photos. And I think it's important to sort of remember that and remember that, you know, how things have changed and, and just appreciate that, that moment. So much of what can happen in a moment is difficult to preserve, but the amount that you and your team have managed to do is pretty incredible and chair. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Lindsay. And I look forward to when I have an opportunity to visit your museum and get to see some of the work up close and personal, because it sounds like you guys are doing a fantastic job of showcasing his legacy and bringing that to new generations. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And now, the question of the day. Last time on The Roundhouse, we were talking with Steve Vaughn Sr., an engineer with experience on both the Erie Lackawanna Railroad and the Delaware and Hudson. Thinking about all the railroading from the past and from that era led to the question of the day, if you were alive in the 80s, what was your favorite railroad to rail fan? And if you weren't, which do you wish that you could have seen? A lot of interesting responses. So here's some of the ones that I selected. First from the roundhousepodcast.com. Dan Pagach writes, Growing up in the suburbs of Boston, Massachusetts during the 80s, I would rail fan the MBTA commuter rail that my dad took daily to get to work. Although I do not model passenger trains on my layout, I still have a soft spot for those silver and purple passenger coaches. On YouTube, Eric Swanson writes, if I was around in the 80s, I would have wanted to see Southern Pacific in action. But my dad grew up near the Missouri Pacific line that went through South Holland, Illinois. And he sometimes takes me down to the Missouri Pacific Yard Center that is now owned by Union Pacific. 
my father and grandfather actually worked for EMD for a while. When it had its open house in 72, my dad's father actually took him there. From Twitter, Yank in Georgia writes, Conrail all the way. Pensy fan from the start. Conrail got a lot of love from a number of you guys. That was a recurring one that I saw crop up. On Facebook, Jeff Patelsky writes, I grew up in the 80s. Steam excursions on the Southern Railway, later Norfolk Southern, the Chessie Safety Express excursions, all steam, no diesel helpers, track speed, open windows, and vestibules. It was awesome. It sounds awesome, Jeff. This from Edward Meller, born in 1975, so I got the last of some of the greatest Rock Island Mopac, MKT Frisco, and many others with my dad before he died in 1982. And lastly, Richard Shirey writes, Yes, I was very much alive during the early 80s and was serving in the U.S. Air Force. Thank you for your service, Richard. While I was stationed at McClelland Air Force Base in Sacramento, I enjoyed rail fanning the SB Roseville Yard and surrounding areas like Donner Pass. I was also able to rail fan to Hatchapi, Mojave, and Barstow, but never made it to Cajon Pass. A couple of places I missed out on was the Inside Gateway, wish I could have made it to Keddy and Beaver, Also wish I would have known about the SP's Northwestern Pacific. That is where a lot of their Cadillacs saw daily operations. But I have some great memories and memorabilia from that time period, including a timetable, which he had pictured in the Facebook comments, and a number of 19 orders written on, a number of Form 19 orders specifically, written on onion paper. The crew of an eastbound train that was stopped at the home signal at Roseville recognized my military haircut, asked me if I was serving. I told them I was, and I had an interest in railroading. They handed me all of their paperwork they no longer needed. These are now treasured pieces of my memorabilia collection. Thank you for sharing your stories. I love reading all the comments, even those that I don't have the time to share here at the end of the episode. But I hope you enjoyed being part of the question of the day as much as I do. This is always a conversation, and I love learning from you guys just as much as hopefully you enjoy learning from the guests we have here on the show. Your question of the day for this episode is, what is your favorite O. Winston Link photograph? Let me know on the roundhousepodcast.com, links to social media. Don't forget to visit the roundhousepodcast.com for that episode 100 poll. Check out the guests that we've had. And maybe you'll look at that list and realize, hey, I need to get caught up on some episodes. And now is a great time to do that. Thank you for tuning in. And remember that the Roundhouse is our house. Roundhouse.